I say, I hope they're not. Oh, no, they're home. My God, get it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm so, just, just allow me here, just for a moment. I'm looking at something here. Just uh, looking at something here. Uh, before we go any further, I would like to uh, see what is his name here. Da, 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 de. Oh, yes. Uh, would you please prepare that uh, salute music in there, please? Uh, I would like to. Yes, that's it. That's right. All right. Okay. All right. One, two, three, four. That's it. Bring it up. Bring it up. Big, big. I just feel like clearing out the sinuses. The bear missed the train. Bear missed the train. Bring it up big. Bear missed the train. Now he's walking. The bear missed the train. Ah, the bear missed the train. Come on, bring it up big. I want to cover me up. All it. Reset that. We may use that again later. Have you had a slight suspicion that you've missed the train yourself? The bear missed the train. Da, 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 da. Do you want to hear a wild story? Now I'm just going to just going to read a story uh, to you, just as it was reported. You know, I've had a theory for a long time. Y you know, it seems that the more you you look at life and the more you live the more you have to come to the conclusion that a lot of the old cliches were are not cliches at all, but actually truths. Now, that's a, <laughs> I hate to admit it, you know. I can remember when I was a kid, you know, somebody would come out with this cliche. They'd say, oh, you look before you leap. And they'd say, oh, come on, Dad, what are you talking about? Oh, that's ridiculous. Of course, that ha I, I was saying that before I fell off the garage. And... <laughs> Oh my God! I'll never forget that. What you want to hear? How I came? How I came to 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 take one off the garage? Well, you you see, uh, I've felt that a lot of things go to make up a man's future personality that are not recorded on the official chronography of his official things. In other words, you're laying there on the couch, and old old uh, Doctor Freud is looking over your corner. You know, he's looking down on you somewhere from the psychiatrist heaven. And uh, you're talking about all these things, the actual things that happened to you that caused you to be this quivering bowl of jello, are hardly ever discussed because most of them don't have anything to do with sex. And that's about all you ever talk about when you're laying in those places, right? Well, I'm going to tell you one of, one of the things that the forever, that forever, seriously, forever uh, colored my outlook on life. See, I was about uh, 10 or 12, see, and I got into this, I got into this building electronics bag. Uh, and I've ne it's never left me. You're listening to K2ORS if you want to know what the call is, right? So, you know, first class phone that works. And uh, by the time I was 12, I had so far transcended uh, all the people around me. See, once you get into an esoteric pursuit, a truly esoteric pursuit, you leave your friends behind. The word, you look up the word esoteric, and that's what it means, in effect. <laughs> in other words, if you were, were interested in weather, you'd be with everybody. Everybody talks about weather. But if you happen to get hung on, let's say, uh, um, just for argument's sake, uh, um, New Mexico cactus culture, well, very shortly, you would find that your friends are not interested in this. No matter how hard you try. So, hey, uh, hey, Schwartz, do you know that there is one cactus that every 24 years produces one flower that uh, whistles Dixie? It's a, uh, so what? You, you know, and, and eventually you start peeling your friends away, right? This is, uh, this will also happen when you get involved with a girl. Uh, the, uh, you find yourself uh, at, at the age of roughly 14, you suddenly find yourself driving driving uh, your bike or your car, whatever it is you go with, it back and forth in front of this girl's house instead of hanging around down at the bowling alley. And uh, it, it, you begin to slowly carve out your esoteric pursuit of Esther Jane Alberry. And uh, everybody, everybody, you know, is doing his thing, and you're you've, you're losing him. Well, this is what happened to me. I was ten or twelve, to roughly ten and a half, I would say. I was in the middle of my tenth year, 
and I am squatting down at the local library for no not no only one reason was I at the library. Eileen Akers was down at the library all the time, and I think culture is often. Uh, when it's absorbed by the male, is because there are females involved. Now, this may seem to you as a truism, but uh, only when you look back over your life, you will realize how damn true it is. I wonder how many concerts I went to because there was this girl who says, oh, I'd just love to go to the concert. Concert. So you wind up sitting down there somewhere and somebody's playing Prokofiev and your bottom is falling asleep and you've got plans for later. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, you know, eventually you, you, you find yourself beginning to be interested yourself, possibly, in some of these cultural pursuits. But it is uh, the original carrot that dangled before your eye that, uh, that brought it all about. So, anyway, I'm sitting down at the library, right, because Eileen Akers had a job. And she was about 10 or 12. She, a bunch of kids were working in the library filing books. And I was... Boy, I had a thing, see, on her. And so I'm sitting at this table where they had the magazines. Now, there were several magazines that the that kids looked at. For example, uh, Boy's Life. Have you ever read Boy's Life? Of course. Uh, so Boy's Life, do you know that I have the entire, one guy, a guy sent me the entire year of Boy's Life? Yeah, they're all neatly bound, see? And you go through the whole year of Boy's Life, and... <laughs> <laughs> it's almost every every issue was exactly alike. But you don't know this when you're a kid. As a matter of fact, when you're a kid, you want it to be alike. Kids enjoy repetition. Uh, you can't tell a kid the same story enough. Uh, they like to see the same thing over and over again. This is why, for example, so much of the bubblegum rock is repetitious over and over and over again. It's kid stuff. So anyway, I'm sitting in this... this uh, this library, not aware that, uh, let's put it this way, fate was laying a trap for me. And I had this copy of Boy's Life. So I looked at the Boy's Life. There's old local Dan Beard looking out of Boy's Life. He had a column. There was a guy named Dan Beard. And he was always writing about how you could tell the which way was north by looking at the trees. But well, we didn't have any trees. I mean, for God's sakes, I mean, the uh, I remember one time going on a hike with Mr. Gordon in True 41, and we didn't have any trees to look on the north side of to see which where the moss was. So he painted moss on all the all, on all the fire plugs, you know, put green paint there. And the next day we'd go and check check out north. So I'm sitting in this library, and they had these articles on how to build things. You know that uh, Boys Life still has those same articles now. How to build things. See, the, the building uh, urge is very strong among the males between the ages of roughly 10 and 16. It, de it, it quickly declines thereafter. And the urge to get other people to build things for you takes over. But uh, the urge to build things is very important. See, they had this article in there on how to make your own split bamboo fly rod. Well, it looked very simple. They had these drawings, diagrams. It says split bamboo is cut to exact size, shown in diagram. Use wood glue. It shows how to do this. Well, I can only tell you that diagrams are a hell of a lot easier to draw than split bamboo fly rods are to make. I, <laughs> I mean, no way. I, you know, that's, that's why uh, diagrammers are much more important today than actual builders. If you notice that architects get applauded more than carpenters, it's harder, believe me, to be a carpenter. I mean, it's one thing to draw a great building and another thing to make it. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I'm sitting there, see, on this day, and they had a diagram and a big, major article. It says, how to build your own radio set. It says, make your own radio set. And it shows this kid sitting with his own radio set. He had it built into uh, like a shelf back of his bed. And he's, he's got a, a, a speaker uh, that he had a speaker, you know, with a cloth over it. And the speaker was hanging up in the corner and out of it was coming, it said, Moscow. Wow, you know. So um, I looked at that. And there was something about that article that, that did it. And again, I must say that not one out of probably a thousand people feels the excitement of 
the curious magic of electronic communications. Now, uh, you know, no, it's, it's true. Since that time, of course, I've become a, you know, a, a big time amateur radio operator. I have, I have the equipment and stuff. And I'll never forget a friend of mine. I couldn't believe it. This is almost like a, like a guy uh, turning down a, a quart of dad's old fashioned root beer in the middle of the Sahara Desert. I could hardly believe it. No, I'm sitting in the in the in my room one day. This is just recently, and I'm talking to a guy in Frankfurt, Germany, and he is com he's coming through. Man, I mean Q5, 20 dB over S9. He's booming out. In fact, he's he was coming through better than you're probably hearing this station. Knowing this station, that's not hard. That's true. But uh, he was coming through like gangbusters. See, out of the speaker. And his friend of mine walks in the room and he says, what are you doing? I said, I'm talking to a guy in Frankfurt, Germany. And he says, oh, sat down, proceeded to pick his teeth and look out of the window, bored. It didn't occur to him that talking to a guy in Frankfurt from your own room with equipment you've built is a romantic concept. Do you agree? A lot of people don't see it that way. I can't. I can't understand them. No, I can't. I really can't. So uh, anyway, I'm. A, I'm this kid. See, so I, I. I began to get the urge to build this darn thing. Now, uh, do you recall? Now, I don't know whether whether female types do this as much as males. Now, again, this is an empirical observation, but I don't see many females uh, getting involved in uh, winding coils. Do you? Never. I don't know of one that ever did it. I suppose there are immediately. I'm going to get deluge with letters saying, uh, <laughs> but I, all I have to say is I personally have never seen them. So, but but I began to build this radio. Well, now they used a first of all they used a cadmium plated ch a chassis, steel chassis, which it said was easily obtainable at your radio parts house. Well, uh, everything you know, you write this stuff. This is some you know sounds so great, easily obtainable. A cut to these dimensions, of course, this is a standard dimension. Easy. Well, anyway, after about six weeks, I struggled around. I finally got a, uh, a <laughs> I got a bus panel, a panel out of a bus from a junkyard. And it had a piece of metal that went down inside the door. And it was actually aluminum. And I bought this piece of aluminum. And down in the basement, I built a chassis. I wish I had it now. It must have really looked rotten. I mean, I thought it was great, though. You know, I bent it up. My old, my old man had a vice down there at a workbench, you know. And, and you had to cut out of it. You had to chop a hole in it so you could put a transformer in it. You know, you sink a power transformer down there. Well, all he had, I didn't know the difference between a wood chisel and a metal chisel. There is a vast difference, friends. <laughs> And for those of you who don't know the, 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 the point of what I'm saying, all I can tell you is that, is that chopping that hole with my old man's wood chisels took me roughly, oh, I'd say about the third of the time it took to build the Great Pyramid at Giza, but twice as much work. So I'm chopping away. I finally get the hole out. I don't even want to tell you what happened uh, two or three weeks later when the old man came downstairs and tried to use his wood chisel. So, you know, nothing is worse for a wood chisel than to use the chop holes in metal. So nevertheless... I finally got the radio built. It took me six months of fooling around and, and uh, you know, getting the stuff and, uh, and making the coils, winding the coils and all that, and, and it didn't work. Simply couldn't get it going. I, uh, totally impossible. And so I, I was really, really disappointed. That's a fantastic disappointment. It's like buying this, this $74 flying model airplane. And it doesn't fly. Simply won't do it. I wonder how many people have gone out and bought themselves this thing that they were really anxious to get, and they finally brought it home, plugged it in, and nothing. That happened to you ever? That's a common experience in the 20th century, friend. You're lucky. I have known people, when they did plug it in, the entire side of the house blew up due to uh, you know pulling 17 million amps through a, <laughs> through a circuit that should use only a 30-watt ball bin. But uh, that's part of it. So uh, I, 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 I was really disappointed, fantastic disappointment. And, and I remember asking my father, say, I was reading these diagrams over, trying to figure out where I went wrong. I said to my father, Dad, because I figured at that point, I, you know, I was 11, I figured my old man knew everything. You, you know, there's a period in your life when you think this is true. 
And, uh, of course, then there's also a period when you think you know everything. That period uh, often lasts longer in most guys and is usually even more disillusioning <laughs> when, the, when, the, when the realization hits. So I said to the old man, I said, Dad, uh, um, what is a grid leak? And he says, what? What is a what? And I says, what is a grid leak? And I had the diagrams and the whole bit, see, from the, from the boy's light there. I says, what, what is a grid leak, Dad? He said, a grid leak. Oh, a grid leak. Oh, of course, a grid leak, yes. Uh, well, uh, see, a lot of uh, grids leak, you know. And uh, that's a thing to keep the grid. It's a kind of a plug. It keeps the grid from leaking. Well, <laughs> somehow I instinctively knew that this was not only a cockamamie answer, it was a ludicrous answer. And I says, no, Dad, a grid leak, you know, a grid leak. Here, see, here it is on the diagram, this little wiggly line. It says grid leak, two megohm, grid leak, two megohm. He says, oh, two megohm, two megohm. Well, that's one of those, uh, well, you know how they use leaders. No, it's a, that's a two megohm wide grid plug there. You plug the grid with that. I knew I was on my own. Already I was beginning to move away from the family. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, uh, these, uh, this, uh, this, is the, this is the way it goes. See, when you're involved in, in machines, and as a kid, I began to realize that the more I got involved in electronics, the less friends I had. But the friends I did have were also involved in electronics. And so all the friends that I hung around with were all guys that were studying for their ham ticket. And they were all, you know, they're all hung on uh, building equipment. And uh, I, I began to get in the, into that bag. Well, finally, I, 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 there was a quantum leap. There's a leap in your life when you, when you leap out of the egg and you become a, a chrysalis or a pupa or something. You leap out, anyway, from, uh, from 10 to 12. I suddenly made a quantum leap. And uh, now I was really on top of it. And uh, I was building equipment. I, I built a, in fact, at the age of uh, something like 13, I, I had built a complete single, uh, what they call a single signal, uh, three IF stage, uh, super hat for short wave receiving. <laughs> it was really a complex situation. And uh, the old man was totally confused by this. He'd walk around, he'd look in the front bedroom where I was working on this stuff, and they, he'd just walk away. And uh, my mother, though, was not like that. Uh, her her general attitude was always, uh, you're going to get a shock. Which was, uh, you know, an acceptable risk. Uh, she was right. I could get a shock. It wasn't until the day that I got a shock <laughs> that I realized how right she was. But that was when I went into transmitters, and one day I got myself across 1,200 volts at 300 mils. And uh, I was thrown 35 feet under the day bed in the next room. At that point, uh, you know, I began to realize. But nevertheless, on this, this particular great Saturday, when all my life changed, I had built this receiver, which was actually a three-tube uh, super regenerative receiver. You know what super regen is? Super regenerative. That has a great sound. It has a, has a sound almost uh, genetic, and it's, and it's uh, super regenerative. That's like a super stud. Anyway, this was a super regenerative receiver. So they have great names like, oh, yeah, the electronic world is full of fantastic names like cathode follower. A cathode follower. That has either political overtones or uh, overtones of hookerism. Uh, a cathode follower. It's a ca negative feedback. There's a good phrase. How often have you heard that in a meeting at the old office? Negative feedback. <laughs> That's a that's an electronic phrase, um, uh, you know. These are all. Uh, uh, how about uh, rectifier? That's a good phrase. Or dual diode rectifier, duo diode rectification. Or uh, how about selenium rectifier? That's a good one. That sounds like the name of a uh, of a coming Greek heavyweight champ. So uh, nevertheless, I am I'm get, you know getting into this stuff and. And uh, really, really getting serious. And I built this receiver. Now, there was one thing that was lacking. When you go into high-powered receiving and or transmitting, there's one thing you got to have, an antenna. There's no way to fake an antenna 
<laughs> when you're when you're trying to uh, when you're trying to hear uh, when you're really trying to do something with with the radio equipment. That little uh, that little iron filing coil that you got in the back of your Japanese transistor does not do it. No way. And in fact, you know, I suspect that a lot of people would be astounded at the capability of their little transistor radio they've got if they ever put an antenna on it. Do you ever do you ever see somebody take a little pocket transistor radio, open up the back, and put about this 50 feet of uh, very thin, like number 24 horsehair wire on it? Oh, fantastic! They they have tremendous sensitivity, terrible selectivity, but terrific sensitivity. You'll pick up all kinds of stuff with that radio that you wouldn't have believed. But uh, nevertheless, I'm I'm about to put up an antenna, so I uh, I went down to the lumber yard. And I bought myself uh, four 20-foot 2x4s. Now, you know what a 20-foot 2x4 is. And, and I, I paid a dollar extra to have them split, which meant that they split them right down the middle. That meant I had four, eight, actually eight, 20-foot uh, 2x2s. And I, I loaded them. <laughs> I loaded them up, and, and uh, we, uh, Flick had this car, this old car that his old man had, and we brought these things tied to the roof of the car. We brought them back home. He was helping me build this antenna. So I was going to put the antenna. One end of it was going to go on the garage, and back of the house was maybe 70 feet away, back 65, 70 feet in back, back of the lot. And I was going to put the other uh, antenna post, the other mast, was going right at the peak of the roof of the house, which was a two-story house, you know, the kind that uh, has a long sloping roof. And it, it looks so easy, see, so simple. So I, I got this damn thing. Uh, I, I says, well, we'll start with the garage, Flick. We'll put the, we'll put the post up, we'll put the pole up on the garage first, and then, you know, it won't be any problem to get it up on the roof because we can go right up through the attic, right? No problem at all. So we put a ladder up, and I'm, I'm up on top of the house. This is the first, the first moment in my life that I began to realize that there is much more to existence than just walking around and uh, buying another Butterfinger bar and hanging around the library looking at Eileen Akers. I get up on the garage, and we had worked it out so that Flick had, had a rope attached to the top of the two-by-two, two which we were going to sink. We had, we'd, we'd attached two of them together, by the way, with bolts. We had 40 feet of pole now. You got it? We were going to raise it up. Flick was going to pull this clothesline, and I was going to be on the garage, see, guiding it up. And as it got up, we were going to sink it down into the ground, at which point Flick was going to take these big ten-penny nails we had got, and he was going to hammer them right through the two-by-twos into the side of the wooden garage. No problem, right? We had attached to the top of it, we had attached a, a glass insulator <laughs> and, and 150 feet of stranded copper wire. So it was going to drip down. It was going to be really great, see? This was called a guileless antenna, according to the instructions that came out in, in, uh, in Boy's Life. I'll never forgive Boy's Life for this afternoon. So as Flick started to pull this thing up, I'm guiding it up, and it's about maybe two-thirds of the way up now. It's up, and I'm struggling. Now, I was no little kid, remember. I, I was a hefty kid for my age, and I'm, I'm struggling with this thing, pulling it up, and Flick is down there, and I could see Flick. He seemed to be a mile and a half away, pulling on the rope. And he kept telling me, pull it away from the garage! I can't pull it up! And I says, Flick, I can't reach out too far! So we're struggling up. We get the thing about almost at the top, When it happened, it slowly began to tilt. The, the weight was unbelievable. Now, I could figure this out. The fulcrum, you know, you could figure out for the laws of physics well, how much weight was going. But all I know is that as I'm hanging on this garage, it began to be almost like hanging out to the back end of a Mack truck. It slowly started to go down. And I kept hollering, Flick, pull the rope! For God's sake, Flick, pull the rope, pull the rope! And Flick says, I can't, I can't. I see Flick sliding, and the pole begins to slowly go down, and it's picking up speed, though, as it goes, and I'm grabbing. It fell <laughs> right across Brunner's kitchen, which was back next to our garage, 
And I don't know whether you've ever had 40 feet of two by two fall across the top of a kitchen roof, but it landed and as it hit, it jumped. And I still had a whole part of it. It was a sliding up the side of the garage. It pulled me off and slingshotted me. I literally was, <laughs> I was slingshotted about 15 feet across the yard and into a pile of, of irises. <laughs> and, and I was, I, I can recall sliding through the stickers and flick pulling the rope. And at that point, I remember Mrs. Bruner coming out of the backyard, coming out of the kitchen with her, with her eyes, you know, like, like searchlights, screaming. And my mother coming out, what are you doing? I told you to stop that fooling around in the garage. And, and from next door, Mr. Anderson came out and says, I call the cops. We'll get that straightened out. You'll notice that I'm still uh, persisting in the same terrible habit. That uh, there's no, there's no getting around it. Uh, you will be exactly what you are at ten throughout the rest of your life. Oh yes, I've known many ten-year-old accountants. Oh, absolutely. I've known ten-year-old drunks, ten-year-old bums. <laughs> I've known ten-year-old used car salesmen. Already they got those big, bright, shiny teeth, you know, and that the whole look. I've known, uh, yeah, yeah when you, from the minute you're 10 years old on, that's just no turning back. You're going to be doing the same thing. And I'm still putting up antennas that pull me off the roof and uh, <laughs> playing with poles that are far too high for human beings to comprehend. So, uh, you know, try clean thoughts. It may work. <laughs>